Over the past decade, art galleries and museums have had to evolve to keep up with changing technology and to shifting views of what's appropriate to display as artifact. They've also had to connect with communities they haven't had great relationships with in the past. It's all raised important questions for the sector and for the public. Joining us now to explore these changes in Hamilton, not that Hamilton, in Hamilton, Bermuda via Skype, we have Gail Lord, president and co-founder of Lord Cultural Resources. And here, braving the cold in our studio, we've got Sylvia Porney, curator of anthropology in the Royal Ontario Museum's Department of World Cultures. We also have Gordon Shadrach, portrait artist, and Andrew Hunter, senior curator at the Art Gallery of Guelph. Welcome to you all. You. Um, I would like Thank to you. pose the first question to everybody, but I think I'll start with Gail since she's not here in the studio with us. Are, we, are museums still relevant? They're more relevant than ever. The need is more, more than ever, and the audience is bigger than ever. And Andrew, I noticed that you're wearing um, something, yeah. hashtag justice for Colton Bushy. Yeah. Um, what do you think? Are museums still relevant? I think they are and they can be, but I think they're facing significant challenges to adapt and change. And I think we also, those of us working in the field, um, have to recognize their le the colonial legacy, like the legacy, um, the roots of these institutions as colonial institutions. And I think when we're reevaluating their role, we have to see them within the wider culture. We can't just think about museums within museum and gallery conversations. We have to think of them in the wider culture. Um, as part of society. As part of society. And so when we, when we critique museums for being too white in Canada, we have to think about that within the context of education, politics, the legal systems that led to what happened uh, to Colton Bushi. So it's, uh, we need to have these conversations in a much bigger framework than I think historically that we, we have. And Sylvia? Well, I agree. I mean, museums are relevant. They are in many ways still foundational in the way our educational system works. They're where children go to learn about the nation in many ways and about the idea of the nation and society that they're growing up into. So they're important educational institutions that they need to evolve and transform to keep up with the relevant issues of society. And um, Gordon, you're a self-taught artist. Yes. And you're also a teacher. Yes. Um, are museums still relevant? Well, yeah, I definitely think so as well. When you, uh, I work with grade two students generally, and and um, you can really see the difference between having children just think about concepts and theory, and actually seeing something and making it tangible for them. It's a very important step for their comprehension. But I also think an important part of this. Uh, is also acknowledging that our curriculum is changing so that we're teaching children to question what they see and question how things are being presented and getting them to recognize that there are different perspectives in what we're seeing in museums. So become uh, or be more critical. Yes. Um, do they need to move, do museums need to move beyond being collector of things, Andrew? I think they do. I think we have to, one of the things you have to also recognize is that the, you know, collecting things as a way of recording history or the display of things as a way of, of speaking of history or speaking of culture um, is also very specific to a colonial model. The acquisition of things is a colonial uh, approach. Meaning so, that these uh, items were taken during... So, yeah, or just even the sense of like for me to know about you, I have to get something from you. I have to hold something. Um, so often what we see in museums and archives and galleries is uh, things that that maybe haven't historically been valued within a Western model are just not present. And so going back to what Gordon was saying, absolutely, the curriculum is changing. Students are encouraged to ask questions when they come, which is brilliant, but they also have to encounter things that are relevant to them. So for too many people, coming to museums has been an education in colonial dominance. And too many people have spoken over their histories about, well, the museum isn't really relevant to me because I'm not seeing myself reflected in the artworks, in the objects, in the people who either work there or are leading and governing those institutions. And Gail, do you agree? Do you think the museums should move beyond being collectors of things? Yeah, well, I, I think Andrew's put it very, very well. Um, I think that, uh, for one thing, technology now makes it possible for museums to collect stories as well as objects. And of course, there are conflicting stories about 
the object. And that becomes something really very important for, uh, for a museum to be able to do, to say that for one individual, an object is the stories are of oppression. For another, the stories are of conquest. And so that, that really, uh, that really has to be taken on board. Objects are still very, very important. They're very powerful. And I think that for people of every age group, an object can spark thinking, can spark reflecting, can spark memory. And uh, I think it takes both sides of this. And Sylvia and Gordon, I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about the ROM's new exhibit. Uh, here we are here. Um, Sylvia, tell us about what that exhibit is. Well, it's a contemporary art exhibition featuring nine artists um, from nine black artists. So it's here, if you're, we are here, black Canadian contemporary art. And it's the exhibition that is the end of a five-year project that Julie Crooks, Dominique Fontaine, and I worked together on called Of Africa, in which we really thought of various ways to rethink the way in which Africa and the diaspora was represented within the museum. And uh, we did a number of smaller exhibitions, programs, symposia, and lectures, and really took our time to think of new ways to talk about the history of um, not just Africa, but also blackness in Canada. And it was a very organic, long-term process in which we had multiple conversations and engagement with different members of the community. And here we are here reflects also in its process, a year conversation that we had with the artists. So it was an exhibition that developed also out of workshopping together ideas. and. Uh, we're very happy with the result because it presents multiple perspectives. Um, I, I want to come back to your motives for having this exhibit, but uh, Gordon, you're uh, part of it. Uh, what's your contribution? Uh, I've contributed a painting um, called In Conversation, which is a painting of my niece by marriage. She's not related to me by blood. And it's to show the longevity of uh, black people in Canada. So she's a Nova Scotian black woman and she has Métis heritage as well mixed in with her. And so I created a painting that is um, sort of subverts the code of a selfie, where instead of taking known sort of tropes and ideas, where, which you see commonly in, 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 in selfies, I had her create her own story. So what she's wearing, everything she's wearing in the painting and, and even the background is part of a coded language that she can understand and that I can understand that discusses her feelings about being a black woman in Canada, a contemporary black woman, and what it means to her to be a mother, a partner, a daughter, all those sort of things are all rolled up into this portrait. And being a self-taught artist, what does it mean for you to be a part of this exhibit? Um, I actually, I, you know, it's, it's been an amazing experience, but I also think that it's a signifier for how museums and galleries are evolving. Um, you know, being a self-taught artist and new to the art world, fairly sp speaking, um, I think it's amazing that I was part of this process and the, the diversity of work that we're seeing within the show and art and me being part of it is showing that um, museums are consciously thinking about different ways of bringing in different people, whether as contributors, contributors or as visitors to the museum. Um, now, Sylvia, I want to go back to the ROM, and uh, the ROM has had a troubled past for the black community, you'd say, right? Yeah. Um, what was Into the Heart of Africa? Well, Into the Heart of Africa was an exhibition that the ROM uh, installed in 1989, which was intended to be a self-reflexive exhibition on the origin of African collections at the ROM, and that backfired on a number of levels, but that really didn't present what the criticism to the colonial view and didn't really present the, uh, a critical engagement with collecting in a way that was effective in museological terms. And there was a protest that happened uh, at that point. There was picketing uh, and the museum reacted in, very, in a very closed way. In and, what ways? Well, it didn't engage with the protester on a serious intellectual And people level. were upset with the, the exhibit mm -hmm. because people thought it was racist. 
People thought it was racist because it presented images and words that were drawn from colonial publications, and the counter voice was not heard or was not as strong as those images and those words. So even though the intent was not racist, the result was, yet again, a pretty strong uh, repetition of concepts and ideas that maybe from a white liberal perspective were passed gone, but from the perspective of the black community were still very much parts of the society in which they were living. I know you weren't there at the time, um, but how does this, so is this exhibit a way of uh, making amends? I wouldn't really say that. I think this exhibit is a way of showing that the museum is changing and we want to be a different institution. I mean, I wouldn't really necessarily see this as an amend for Into the Heart of Africa. It's part of a broader process. You don't just do an exhibition. And that's what of Africa wanted to be. And that's why we started with a symposium and not with an exhibition, because it was really about rethinking what we were just talking about earlier. What is the relevance of a museum in the 21st century? What does it mean to have these collections? What are, what can we do to be, to, to transform society or engage with society in a way that it's meaningful and relevant? And to do it with a community with whom the ROM historically had a big fracture. It was a bit, in 2012, we rebranded as a community connector, and it became evident that there was no way of really believing in that brand if we didn't tackle this history. And so... You looked at it head on. Yeah. <laughs> um, Gail and Andrew, I'd like to bring you back into yeah. the conversation. Um, yeah. How can museums foster better relationships with communities they may not have had great connections with in the past? Andrew? Well. Oh, sorry. Right. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, I'd actually like to comment on, on the uh, particular situation of the ROM. I, I do remember that exhibition, and quite frankly, it was racist. It wasn't the imagination of the people protesting it. It was ridiculous that material that was intended as uh, really racially uh, creating a hierarchy of civilization, let's put it that way, was presented at face value. and. Uh, and the curator at the time was not a racist individual, but I mean, uh, thought that everybody would understand the irony. So uh, a few comments. Um, why does it take, and I guess I'm frankly a white liberal, so there we go. <laughs> why does it take, why does it take the ROM almost 20 years to come to terms with something that uh, it occurred in the past? So that, that that's a problem. The other problem, uh, there are a series of problems, and it's not just with the ROM. Uh, another problem is that there is no diversity, or very, very little, I want to say, on, on the boards of our institutions, including the ROM. It's not different from any of the others in that respect. And I think that unless uh, there's board representation, then there isn't really a, a huge policy initiative. Maybe what the ROM should be doing, it's great to do the exhibition. I've seen the exhibition. It's a terrific exhibition. Uh, and, and Gordon, congratulations on your piece. I think it, it, it's, a, it's a powerful portrait. But I'd like to see the ROM, which uh, advocate that we need a, an African-Canadian museum. Uh, I think it's high time that our, that our museums actually took a stand on some things rather than saying, oh, we're going to do better, watch us do better. Well, Sylvia, I'll, put, I'll let you respond to that. Well, yes, I mean, but I think an African-Canadian museum, it's a wonderful thing, but it should also be something that the ROM and the community advocate for. It's not just the ROM's decision. And I mean, from the point of view of the ROM, we have an obligation to do better, and that's what we can really act on. Do you upon. think, though, that 20 years is too late? Well, you know, I, it's hard for me to say um, I wasn't there, and uh, it's something that I started working from the moment I got my job on. And it took, you know, it took time for me to build a relationship with the community because I'm not from the community. And that's also part of the diversity issue. Mm -hmm. But it is also true that really, um, yet still, and, and this is a broader thing that we are working on with uh, um, youth internships and trying to get kids interested and in the museum when they're in high school. Because it's, it's about building that culture. It's about building and opening up, being part of the museum profession as a possibility early on. Because when, when I was hired, there weren't a lot of people from the community that 
had gone through the educational path that is required to become a museum curator. Also because there's not that real, there wasn't, and it's long-term building, uh, just given this as a possibility. Well, I would like to ask uh, Andrew and Gordon, mm -hmm. what do you think about the possibility of having a museum that celebrates black Canadians? Um, it's interesting, this idea of youth engagement, because that is something that I've noticed that since I've been showing my work, I've been uh, meeting a lot of uh, young black people um, who have been really excited to see my work. And I think, just like what Sylvia was saying, I think that it's a big, big picture, because if youth of today aren't recognizing that they have value and they have a voice in these institutions, you know, when I beat in, I was born here 51 years ago and I didn't see representation when I was a child. And if you, young people today still don't recognize that they have the power to be part of this, then there's a lot more going on that has to be worked on as a whole society. So before we get to the museum, we have to work at the structure in, that's in place right now. Just in the fact that I don't think, um, from my experiences, I feel like some people aren't recognizing that, that these institutions are open to them, that there, that there are things available to them and that they can actually be part of it and things to aspire towards. Mm -hmm. Andrew? Yeah, I would, well, there's two threads to that. I think, um, first of all, I'll go back and talk about, um, I think we, I don't think we can operate from the beginning, right out of the gate saying like there has to, the solution is another museum. I think we actually have to go back beyond that and ask what are the fundamentals? What is a museum, what was it set up for? Um, and so the model, the Western model of a museum may not be the best answer. So recently, I've been doing this series with a colleague, Liz Akiriko, of interviews with young uh, emerging black artists and curators and scholars up to grandmothers to, uh, to established scholars. Um, uh, over the last while, we've done about 16 or 17 of these. But so often, the comment that's coming out of the younger artists and the younger scholars, so for example, I met a young woman at Western the other day, 19 years old, eighth generation black family from Dresden. And she talked about, it was really bang on. She said like, there's a certain point where you sort of think like how much tweaking, it's slow to rework um, a, an institution that is so deeply flawed. Like, does it make sense to just tweak those or does it not make sense to actually start and build something that is more relevant to the culture? Right. So as as Gordon said, like, I don't think it's enough to say we should build a community, uh, a museum for black Canadian culture if that's not what the community wants. And and if the community doesn't want that, that doesn't mean those resources shouldn't be available to approach it in other ways. On the one hand, I agree that for, you know, we want to encourage young people coming up that they they're have a role in these public institutions. They are public, so you should be able to. The problem we see repeatedly, and it's particularly a problem in art museums, is that it isn't accessible. There is a barrier there. At institutions like the Art Gallery of Ontario, there is a barrier to being part of that institution's governance. Um, if you want to be a participant in their acquisition committees and programs, right? The people that actually decide That's what right. that museum will collect, you have to write a check. Uh, yeah. Gail, would you say that uh, museums yeah. are deeply flawed? Well, I, I think that, first of all, uh, it's both and, and so uh, that applies to lots of people. And I think that our major institutions have to both open their doors, which they're starting to do, and that's great. But I think that they should, uh, obviously, they shouldn't start an African-Canadian museum. I mean, that wasn't silly. I didn't say that. <laughs> um, what they need to do, though, is support people who want to start it. And please, don't sit there and pretend you don't know that people want to start it. That's been going on for 30 years, 40 years. We, we have the Black Artist Network in Toronto, which is started by Karen Carter and a number of other people. So I don't think people in the field should be saying, we don't know if they want one. They want all people. <laughs> well, Sorry, that was the implication. Mm -hmm. That was the implication. Why Sorry, don't you may, say yeah? may, may I interrupt? I, I don't know. To me, I don't think that was the implication in my in my perspective. I think no, it wasn't yours. Sorry, no, 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 no. I know, but no, but I'm saying from what from what was said. I think the idea is that when we look at things like museums, um, especially when we look at how they traditionally are a collection of objects, there's also a really strong desire to move forward, and so. 
when we look at an idea of creating a museum, an African-Canadian museum, it's not just a matter of telling the stories that have happened in the past, mm -hmm. but how we're producing new work for the future and to show the directions that we're Absolutely going in. Absolutely right. And I think that's where the, heart, the work is really going to be coming in. Sylvia, um, can museums move past uh, those colonial roots that we've been talking about? I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm an optimist. I work in a museum because I do think that museums can be relevant, can engage in different types of conversations without denying the history. But at a certain point, collections themselves can be transformed, can be resignified, can be uh, can become a, a starting point for different types of conversations. So it's really also finding ways to go beyond specific ways of displaying objects. And this is something that in my case, I, I would really like to rethink and redo, for example, the idea of a permanent display and what mm. are the stories. We still have these old objects, and these old objects are relevant. If anything, Into the Heart of Africa brought to the fore that these objects are relevant, and the way they're talked about is relevant. So what are these different stories that we can tell? And it's not something I can decide. It's something that I would like to decide with different members of the community. So the, the role of the curator then can become the, of a broker of conversations and find new ways in which these materials that are still important because people come and see objects. Objects do elicit emotions, do elicit intellectual responses that maybe a screen doesn't. So I, I like the materiality of the object, but then the stories around them have to change. Gordon, how can museums appeal to different generations? Coming as an artist as well as a teacher, I think ideally in a perfect world, our school boards would start forming uh, stronger relationships with museums, if we could have more immersive experiential uh, time in museums. There should be more sort of partnerships between schools mm -hmm. uh, to incorporate it into the curriculum and to incorporate it into their daily practice. Uh, I think in, it's easy to say, harder to do, but I do think it's something that we should really start looking at as a way of, of turning public institutions more public, you know, mm -hmm. reach out to the schools. Mm -hmm. And what do you think, Andrew? Oh, well, I agree. I mean, I think it is something that does actually happen more often in smaller and medium-sized yep. communities um, because one can create these relationships. I and mean, the University of the Archive of Guelph, where I am now, has that relationship. I didn't create it. It's been there historically. And so, um, and that also goes back to something Gail said about who's on the boards, who's coming forward. Like, you know, we have people on our board who are teachers, curriculum advisors, who are right. directly engaged. And so it's not just about rich business people, right? right? Um, and it's also like we we have to be conscious of like when the decisions are made, they are public. I don't want to like you know once again slam AGO, but you can't have an art gallery of Ontario with a white man as its president of its board. And you used and to a, work there. Actually. Yeah, a U.S. gentleman as white man as its director, who then hires a white British man via the United States to be its chief curator in 2018 in Canada. And then if that's your makeup of the people that are at a museum and a Why gallery. Why not? Why not? Because I don't, it's not that I'm saying people can't come from outside, but there has to be a balance. There has to be a mix. You have to come into this context understanding what the context is. What are the ideas that are going on? Not just about the art world, but socially, politically across the country. Right? And so we're supposed to be, institutions are political. They're public, therefore they're political, right? And so if you're going to be engaged in the, poli in the political discourse of a country, you have to be kind of, you have to root in that. You have to understand that. And what I would challenge anybody, anybody, whether you live in Toronto and you're looking for a job in Toronto or you're from outside looking at work here, to ask that question, like I said, that I try to ask myself and many people do, is about what does it mean for me to be in that role or not be in that role, right? Should I be the one to come at this time in this country with all that we're dealing with and take that position. And the boards that are doing the hiring all across the country, they have to ask themselves that. The art museums are the worst for being disconnected, right? You it's think too have, yeah. driven by the contemporary art world and money and collecting. Like, it's like, so it's gone out of whack. And, he's, and I guess, as I said at the beginning, we're all here talking about public museums. Well, we started and they're the not operating as public. Well, right? we started the conversation yeah. by asking, are museums still relevant? Yeah. So we'll probably wrap up the conversation yeah. by saying, um, what more would you like to see museums do to stay relevant? Gail? 
Well, I think that uh, Andrew's made some very brave points, and I'd, I'd like to pay a little bit of tribute to the fact that it takes some courage to say what he said, and I think, by the way, he's, he's quite largely right. I think museums have to uh, open themselves up to the public. I think the curator, uh, Sylvia, has been a sterling example of what contemporary curatorship is. I also agree very much with what Gordon said, which is that exhibits do have to be more immersive. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Ontario, we're a very rich province, and yet our museums are pretty backward when it comes to using appropriate technologies, making uh, Wi-Fi available, uh, being 24-7 accessible, and the kinds of things that young people expect. So I think that, again, uh, Andrew made a good point. Where should the next level of investment be? And uh, how can they expand the collections and the stories? These are the things that we need to do. We have less than one minute, and Sylvia, I'll let you have the last word. What more can museums do to stay relevant? Well, really connect very, in a true sense, with communities, I think. It's really about creating relationships that are long-term and not just project-based, and really have conversations also in times in which there's not a specific exhibition focus, mm -hmm. to really think and rethink what the long-term presence of collections, objects, and public engagement can mm -hmm. be in relationship to different themes. And I think, I mean, if, if anything, the lesson of, of Africa being a five-year project was really about how important it is to come to the table at different times and discuss different things from just ideas to specific projects. And I think those kind of long-term relationship can really change the way in which museums see themselves and engage with their publics. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all for helping us to understand this issue mm -hmm. more. Uh, Gail, hopefully you don't enjoy the sun too much. Um, <laughs> well, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to a lot of museums. <laughs> have, a, have a great time in Bermuda, um, Hamilton, yeah. Bermuda. Andrew, thank Sylvia, so and Gordon, thank thank you, uh, thank congratulations you. on your exhibit. Thank you very thank much. Thank you all for being here. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thanks. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.